good evening everyone welcome to the inaugural talk of ama healthcare week on wellness through management we hope all of you will enjoy this uh, seven days talk and learn new things about prevention and that management of health and wellness i would like to request sri divya stadia sir vice president of ama to share more details about the healthcare week and take it forward thank you thank you mukund uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen on behalf of the amdavad management association uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this inaugural talk of the ama healthcare week uh, with the theme wellness through management organized under the auspices of the national healthcare mission gog uh, ama niramay samvedna kendra Dr. Ravi, you are online. Yes, I I hope I'm audible to all. Yeah. Okay. And it gives me immense pleasure to welcome Dr. Jayanti Ravi, who is a speaker for today's talk with the title "Prevention is Better Than Cure." In the past, AMA has organized health weeks with different themes, you know, like preventive health talks. then talks on specific areas like you know uh, oncology cardiology or neurology and some related topics you know like hospital management and public health also the covid-19 pandemic has created a lot of distress distress and disruption you know in fact uh, there is the you know, issues about you know, as the words they are used that about lives and livelihoods and in fact the very the whole covid crisis has made this program in fact online otherwise all of you have loved to be in our wonderful auditorium in a large quantity but yes this is the way things have changed and uh, you know the also the healthcare infrastructure has overwhelmed during the peak times but we have all learned a lot the covid 19 pandemic as i said has given us a lot of lessons citizens healthcare professionals and the government administration are trying their best you know to manage the situation and trying to prevent or minimize the effects of the third wave if at all it comes in fact the term third wave is the title of the book by the famous author uh, alvin toffler whose other book was titled future shock so let's hope there is not a shock in future uh, this scenario in fact inspired us to organize this healthcare week with the theme wellness through management with a lineup of distinguished persons that include academicians government officials and medical experts today uh, first day our inaugural talk dr jayanti ravi the former principal health secretary government of gujarat government will speak on prevention is better than cure tomorrow's talk by professor sudhir jain director of iit gandhinagar he is going to be on managing covid-19 on campus these are learnings from their experiences at uh, uh, iit gandhinagar then on wednesday 23rd june uh, we will have professor chitranjan chatterjee of iim amdabad who will talk on healthcare and hospital management in the post covid era on thursday 24th uh, professor dilip mavlankar of the indian institute of public health will talk on building a healthy india through public health management you must be seeing him on tv on different talk shows in the evening because he is one of the experts in public health then on friday 25th our fifth talk will be dr avinash tank a very well known gastroenterologist uh, in amdabad who will talk on how to manage yourself from post covid infections and black fungus yes black fungus had really created havoc uh, in the second wave sorry uh then on uh, saturday 26th june it will be the well known psychiatrist of amdabad dr hansel pachech who will talk on how to balance work and life and manage yourself during challenging times the final talk on sunday 27th will be by dr v n shah of zaidus hospitals who will talk on how to manage yourself during and after covid 19 before we begin today's talk i will briefly introduce dr jayanti ravi the former principal secretary of health and family welfare 
at the government of Gujarat and who will shortly take over as the secretary of the Orville Foundation uh, near uh, Puducherry. Uh, Dr. Jayanti Ravi, who is an IS officer of the Gujarat Kader and has worked for many years as an outstanding civil servant, a nuclear physicist by qualification. She holds a PhD from the MS University Baroda and a master's in public administration from Harvard University. She was a Mason Fellow and awarded the Litor Award while she was in Harvard. She has also been a Shimling Scholar at the London School of Economics. She is a column writer and a visiting professor at Harvard Kennedy School. She has worked in various sectors ranging from health to information technology, education to energy in different districts of Gujarat and has also worked in the PMO as a director in the National Advisory Council. She has a rich experience in health, education and rural development sectors. Her talks on Indian culture and heritage in the modern context are well received. She is also a performing classical vocalist. I remember Dr. Ravi, your performance, uh, I think five, six years ago at AMA, when your daughter also performed dance and your son played the flute, it was a wonderful function. And I'll also mention that uh, she has written three books. The last one is going to be released, though it was published last year, but it'll be released by the governor uh, in an AMA function on Thursday, coming Thursday, um, 24th at 4.30 p.m. And uh, lastly, before I don't take much of the time, but she has been a great supporter of AMA activities during the years, you know, contributing and through our joint ventures in the fields of education, healthcare, and rural development. Once again, a very welcome to you, Dr. Jayanti Ravi, and it's all yours now, please. Thank you very much, Divesh Bhai. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Yes, you are, ma'am. So good evening to everybody there. I think this is itself a new normal, a new mode yes. that we're all now beginning to work with Correct. and work in. Uh, and, and this is how this pandemic has in a lot of ways dramatically changed our lives. And uh, I think it has, it's been a global uh, pandemic. And as the Bhai said, it has disrupted our lives. It has also brought in with it a lot of distress. We have also lot, a lot, lost a lot of near and dear ones. So all this <clears throat> has been the background of the situation that we find ourselves in. Of course, uh, to start this evening on a brighter note, today also happens to be the International Yoga Day. I'm very happy that this is something that our country sort of piloted and initiated. And it, it is something that has been accepted globally because I think the importance that is now being given to health and well-being, uh, including all aspects, health, not just being uh, referred to as the WHO said, absence of disease, but you know, a complete state of well-being with all aspects, it's very important. And there too, prevention um, is extremely important. And I, th I think the theme for today's talk and the series, you've got absolute great stalwarts to participate in the series. So I also feel very humbled that I've been invited here. It has been an extremely <clears throat> satisfying, also very, very filled with a lot of challenges, a lot of uh, <clears throat> issues that we all collectively, the entire team faced over the last, uh, I was just trying to see how many days has it been. So it's been a very interesting number, perhaps 460 days since the first case uh, was tested positive in Gujarat. It's also been a lot of learning. And while we were all treading on a surface that seemed not to have a very definite, definitive line of treatment, protocols were evolving. At that time, to begin with, there was no vaccine. Today, of course, we are far better off. We have several vaccines available. And, and I think Gujarat has also been a forerunner in the way we have led because I think one of the primary ways of preventing this disease and prevention generally is immunization, even for other diseases. And so in COVID too, Gujarat has led the way. I can say that uh, not only in terms of 
being among the top three in the country in terms of absolute number of people who were vaccinated. But also, if you look in that category, in terms of the numbers of people vaccinated per million population, Gujarat is at the top. So I think there is a lot that we as a state have to be proud of, and it would not have been possible without the active participation of all our stakeholders, which includes <clears throat> the citizens out there, whether in rural areas, um, slums, marginalized segments, those in affluent areas, urban areas. Uh, it includes all the healthcare workers. And I think a big salute, a big shout out to all of them who have tirelessly, notwithstanding a lot of challenges, the onslaught of challenges, issues one after the other, I think they've all really risen to the occasion. And when we also look, of course, a pandemic like this, it doesn't behove, it, it's not expected or we don't really, and we ought not to compare ourselves with others and say we did better or worse because it's not a very sensitive thing to do. <clears throat> but nevertheless, I think the way our healthcare workers as a community, whether it's the nurses, whether it's the class four staff, and especially our doctors, paramedics, day and night, they've all toiled on the hospital floors. I think uh, it, it is something that we all ought to be proud of. And probably the one thing, uh, even in the end, that I'd like to say that the pandemic has really taught us is to absolutely never uh, even uh, have a tinge of arrogance because it has really taught us to be compassionate to be humble, to embrace humility, because a lot of times nature is far more powerful. And when there is something like this, we really have to put our, our teams together and everything together. And as we did, demonstrated the entire world in a record period of time, we've done a lot of research. We've come up with a lot of treatment protocols that seem to work now much better. We are far better informed now than what we were uh, about a year and a half ago. So it's also been a period of intense struggles, but also um, dotted with intense, a large number of breakthroughs, a large number of learnings, stories of despair and hope. And I think this is something that also brings all of us together to realize that when there is suffering, when there is um, difficulties of this magnitude across the globe, it does unite all of us to start putting our heads together and thinking, what have we done right? What have we done possibly which was not right? And how do we fortify our future, our future generations and so on? So with that, I also want to thank AMA, the organizers, the president and all the members of AMA and all of you, uh, the audience who are here uh, today listening to this talk. And as I mentioned, it's been one year, three months, three days uh, from 18th of March. And we're also in the context of this pandemic I want to speak about the theme of today, which is prevention is better than cure. I've put together a presentation and I thought I'll use that to explain some of the thoughts that I have in mind. Thank you. So prevention is better than cure. That's, and, and we're trying to look at today's talk with a COVID perspective. And uh, as we, all know prevention is better than cure is something that we all speak all the time, almost in every sector, but not just the health sector. We say that it's better to nip it in the bud, ensure that something doesn't happen rather than see the consequences. And similarly, in the health sector, we all know that if you uh, invest in health, it is found that it gives a lot of multiplier effect. It gives a lot of snowballing effect, cascading effect across other sectors too. And if we look at this picture on the right, if we look at the flip side of it, if there are diseases, we find that the economic growth slows down, the strategic investment also comes down, aggregate demand also comes down. And similarly, the workforce is again, if there are, um, as, as we call it, uh, dallies, or if there is a disease burden, their productivity goes down, government resources also therefore go down. And however, public health expense goes up, which means that you need to have more taxes. And there is evidence, this is all, these are based on studies of WHO and several leading publications. It also shows that prevention in both the short and long term is cost effective and also has sustainability due to all these reasons. And that in the case of COVID as well, or in other diseases, that a host of preventive approaches 
ranging from screening, vaccination, it could be immunization for other diseases as well, and promoting healthy behavior, et cetera. They are very cost effective because ultimately, um, as I keep telling our people that sometimes it's the social and behavior change communication is as important or sometimes far more important than the uh, act of giving the vaccination. Just to make a point, when we had the measles rubella campaign, I would ask a lot of our health workers when we had these informal focus group discussions, how many minutes did it take you to actually give the jab to a child who had to be vaccinated? The reply would be very quick. They'd say at best about two minutes and then of course a 30 minutes waiting and maybe 10 minutes waiting in the queue. So in all, not more than 45 minutes. But how long did it take to get the parents and that child and the family to decide that they want to get themselves vaccinated? I would say, man banane ke liye kitna time laka? And that would be a big question mark. Sometimes people would agree immediately. Sometimes it would take a long time. And so if we are able to look at all of that, I think if we are able to get people on board it, or get them to accept, understand, and realize the importance, it can really work. So in the context of COVID, of course, we've all heard of the SMS, the famous SMS, and I like to add a V. S is, of course, for soap or sanitizer. Soap is a much better, easily available option. Masks, safe distance, rather than social distance. We don't want to have a social distance, but we have to keep a safe physical distance from each other. Do gaj ki duri, which are honorable, Prime Minister has so beautifully propagated. And of course, ventilation of all the rooms. And so this is again a simple, when we talk of, um, you know, in the context of management, all these wellness through management, I think there are many takeaways for all the members of AMA, members of the public, people like us, wherever we're working, it could be an office, it could be a school, it could be a shop, it could be uh, a home where we stay. I think it's very important that we keep our places ventilated wherever there are uh, contact with people, if there are people coming and going. And therefore, it's very important to have SOPs or workplace standard operating procedures or protocols which are customized for that particular workplace. I remember that when I was camping during the pandemic in Surat for about 11 days, I remember how we actually designed a very comprehensive set of SOPs for the textile markets, the textile um, industry there, and similarly for the diamond units, because you have large number of people coming, sitting on one grinding wheel together, it, and they would actually share those little packets in which, so you had to, it had to be customized in the context of that particular workplace, and therefore ensure that wherever there is this physical touching, you had to ensure that either you can sanitize it or try and minimize uh, this process of spread through all these various measures and to just to share with all of you along with the help of IIPH and our own uh, SHSRC, the State Health Services Resource Center, a very elaborate set of SOPs have been um, designed, have been put together. And so these are available. And if any of you, an AMA too, you can share this with all the members because it will be easy for you to adopt these and maybe adapt these to suit your local context rather than reinventing the wheel. In fact, my own ex office, I still would, you should pardon me if I go back to saying my office because I'm probably just a few days out of office uh, as uh, you know, out of this particular office. And so I would still sometimes slip back to believing that that's where I work. So there too, we had right in the beginning, uh, you know, decided to follow these protocols. So whether it was the meeting room, we'd have one chair which would have a red uh, cello tape properly prominently stuck on it. Then in all the corridors, the staircases, we had all the signages to make it uh, more and more evident. People may know it, but sometimes knowing is different from actually practicing it and carrying it out there. So this is something very basic that we all do. Physical distance at work and in business. The importance of this two meters or six feet distance, whether it's uh, eating places, uh, even, even at lunchtime in organizations, because often that's the time people remove their mask and that's the time we are more vulnerable. So it's important that we follow this. Now, coming to the other practices, the, these were all the non-pharmaceutical interventions. But if we look at the pharmaceutical intervention for 
prevention in the context of COVID and also other diseases. Vaccination is something that we have very, very nicely, it has shown us that in the, even in this second wave that we just saw, people who were vaccinated, it's not that none of them contracted the disease. There were some cases, there were people who developed the disease and there were also about 0.1% is what ICMR has also told us was the mortality in those very rare instances of people who had been vaccinated, but with certain conditions, maybe comorbidities or certain conditions who did um, die. But that percentage was as low as 0.1%, which means that 99.9% of the people who were vaccinated were safe. Some of them may have contracted the disease, but they were able to spring back. The intensity, the virulence of the disease was also less. And therefore, the first target of the country as a whole, our state, every city, would be to ensure that maximum population is covered, the eligible group, the maximum part of it is actually covered. So we have, Gujarat has done very well. Uh, this is as many as 1 crore 72 as uh, this is this data is of yesterday. Of course, today we have something uh, excellent which has been pl planned, the Maha Abhiyan, COVID vaccination Maha Abhiyan from 21st of June. So it's been decided to really ramp it up in a big way because we must also appreciate that India as a, such a huge country that is, has been doing phenomenally well and the supplies also, almost no stone has been left unturned by all the stakeholders, the central government, the vaccine manufacturers and all the other stakeholders to ensure that sufficient stock of the vaccine is available. And now we're really trying to push this in, in a big way. And we still do find instances of vaccine hesitancy. There are some people uh, still wondering whether this is needed and so on. So one of the things we can all do is to, you know, really propagate this message. And first of all, charity begins at home. So if all of us, whoever is eligible falling in any of these categories, get ourselves vaccinated and ensure that we reach out to people around us, in our families, in our communities, in our various professional interest groups and get all of them to get themselves vaccinated. I think Gujarat uh, can really be one of those states where we can do very well in this. And I'll come to that in a slide or two, a slide or two later. And of course, when we talk of this um, proverb, prevention is better than cure. Interestingly, being in, in Gujarat, uh, I've also become a complete Guju now. And so I think we also look at the monetary part of it. You must realize that it's also cheaper. You, you realize that um, if you do these preventive approaches for cardiovascular diseases too, the mortality, by uh, having these approaches, you're able to really reduce it significantly. Globally, about 78% of the cases, we have personally seen something fantastic in the domain of maternal child health. In fact, I'll take a minute here also to share uh, something which has been personally a very, very satisfying uh, exercise. And before that, I'm just going to take a minute to switch, uh, reduce the fan speed so that my throat doesn't dry. <clears throat> yes, back now. So one of the things we did about four years back when we all sat, in fact, I'd taken over as the Commissioner of Health, and we felt that if we looked at the Sustainable Development Goal Indicators, which included um, indicators such as maternal mortality, under five mortality, immunization, sex ratio, and several others, which corresponded to goal three of the Sustainable Development Goals, we realized that our ranking at that time uh, I was a little disturbed and distraught to see that Gujarat's ranking was number 17th natural, na nationally, which meant we were almost somewhere in the middle or lower middle of the entire country. Uh, so not doing very well, nothing to feel very proud of. So we decided that why don't we start addressing these and simple low cost or no cost options, but which require a lot of counseling, a lot of man banana, the social behavior change, uh, related to maternal uh, health, maternal mortality, breastfeeding, mineral, vitamin supplementation, all of this, we really tried to push it in a big way in Gujarat. And I'm extremely happy to share that 
with all these efforts, sex ratio at birth too, it had really dipped to something as low as less than 850. We were around 840. And now in the recently uh, measured NFHS, it has gone up to 950 plus. And this has been possible in a span of about four years. And how is this possible? So on the one hand, we had this massive campaign right led from the top by the Honorable Chief Minister himself and our Honorable Deputy Chief Minister, who's also a health minister, going to different hospitals where girl children were born on the 8th of March of 2018. Of course, it may have seemed like a little token action on that particular day. It sent a very wide uh, message, a very loud and clear message. It was called Nanhi Pari Avataran. And along with it, we also started taking the regulatory action of ensuring that the PCPNDT Act, whether you know there was there was sex determination happening and really carrying out drives and 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 ensuring that even sting operations were being done and we were sealing all of these. So as a result of it, so on the one hand we worked on creating greater awareness, social and behavior change, uh, a kind of mass movement encouraging, motivating people that a girl child is better or as good as a male child, so that they they're not you know sort of uh, thinking of her being a liability and trying to get the sex determined and so on. And parallelly also acting on a regulatory basis. So all these really helped. And today, as we speak, about 10 days back, we had the sustainable development goal results for the entire country out again. So we were at rank 17th, which had improved the next year to rank 7th. And this year, for Gujarat and for the health sector, I must say that we are very proud that we have taken the first position we are the first in the country, the ranking that has just come out for the health sector, goal three of the SDG, where we were, we progressively improved from 17. So it goes to show that when you really work at prevention, rather than later on looking at cure, even this, these are studies that have been done by WHO. We have the reference for all of them across different countries. And if you look at the cycle on the screen, where if the cycle is symbolic of health, what works is not just these behaviors that we're talking of, but also the determinants. And so this public health can be a part of the solution. And if we invest in all of this, we find that the results are extremely good. If we just look again at vaccine coverage and in the COVID perspective, how is it that prevention has helped and how it's better than cure? You found that if you looked at the lower middle income group countries, about 91 of them, if there was a 20% vaccine coverage, we found that about while the cost was 6.4 billion approximately, but it was able to prevent as many as 294 million infections, about 2 million deaths. Of course, death cannot, you cannot assign a value to it, but nevertheless, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, which means you're looking at what has been the impact of this cost and the, the difference between uh, what was what was the what were the number of people that had to be treated even after being vaccinated? And if you divided that by the number of people that you were able to save and the 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 incremental cost effective ratio, effectiveness ratio is two fifty dollars per year of life saved, which is huge. Similarly, if we look at another case study, well, such studies are not yet available for India. So we are looking at these global numbers, and it's a global, a very very recent, a current pandemic, if I may use the word. 40% of the population in South Africa was vaccinated. It's brought down the deaths by 82%. And, and that was in a way also uh, evident when we have these studies of ICMR to tell us that 99.9% .9 of the people who are vaccinated do not uh, die. So that is also a very positive indicator. And similarly, if you can decrease the total healthcare costs, that, that is also, it is found that if you didn't have vaccines, the total health care costs are reduced by 33%. So uh, this is also something that we would like to share with all of you. Similarly, passive testing. If we look at what is it that happens when there is passive testing and when we look at uh, just a minute. Same page, I'm just kidding. No, 
So if you look at the passive testing that happens and the contact testing isolation centers, because these are all the preventive measures that you do, we found that the life years lost, it further decreases by 94%. So this is, again, these are all very encouraging things that show what happens. Now, here is something that almost seems like, uh, you know, something that all of us would love. It's a wishful thinking, we may think, but it's certainly doable. If we don't take any mitigation measures, we see how bad the curve can be, how steep it can be. But however, if we really take all these mitigation measures, it can flatten the curve. And we can, of course, that doesn't mean that you don't have to increase the healthcare capacity. We'll have to do that. But prevention is extremely important. And uh, COVID care is important too. Treatment is extremely important too. But then by prevention, the curve, you can see how this is dramatically brought out by this animation, how we can really flatten the curve or bend the curve, flatten the curve and ensure that very, uh, you know, relatively less number of people are infected by it and so on. So the strategic pillars of response that we had when we um, faced the first wave of COVID, the two peaks that were there in the second wave as well, this has been documented as an intra-action review by the WHO, as well as the Indian Institute of Public Health and IAM Ahmedabad. And uh, we were the first state to have actually gotten this documentation done. I'm also very happy that there has also been a case study written by Professor Vijay Shari Chand of IAM Ahmedabad about Gujarat's response to the pandemic. And, and these are the 10 pillars around which we call them the strategic pillars of response. And we tried to address this whole um, response based on these dimensions. And so these ranged from governance and coordination, promoting COVID appropriate behavior, which is a part of the preventive aspect, community engagement. Again, very important to get the community aligned and especially in the second wave. And now for the third wave, we are banking very heavily on initiatives like Maru Gam, Corona Mukta Gam, having Gram, Yodhas, etc. This is getting the community uh, absolutely, um, shall I say, ignited with this need to be very responsive, responsible, and ensure that COVID appropriate behavior is followed by all of them. Similarly, containing the transmission, surveillance, isolation centers, quarantine, and then vaccination, of course, is going to be one of the main strategies that we have now. Uh, for response to COVID and for also fortifying ourselves, preparing ourselves to be well prepared against the third wave, which is an impending possibility, um, you know, looming on the horizon. Similarly, the infrastructure preparedness and expansion to deal with the treatment part, because having done all of this, if there are cases, and there would be cases as we have shown, even after vaccination, we are not saying that there'll be absolutely no cases, but then the numbers will be hugely, dramatically, significantly less. Of course, we'll also have to work on human resource availability, capacity building, both for the preventive aspect and also for the treatment part. And of course, strengthening the supply and logistic chain, because there's so many aspects related to preventive and the treatment portion of it, which requires supply, logistics. And uh, Gujarat did very well, also in terms of the alternative therapy about the Ayush, and homeopathy response. I would like to also speak a little bit about it a little later. And of course, enhancing the quality of care, addressing the emerging challenges also. We're now looking at sequelae, such as we just heard about mucor mycosis. We're hearing about the multi-system inflammatory syndrome and newer kinds of diseases. We've been having conversation with our task force members like Dr. Tejas Patel, who does say that uh, post-COVID complications, including uh, clots, etc., are being seen in uh, some instances, and therefore it's important that we are aware of these emerging challenges and keep ourselves, uh, brace ourselves to be able to deal with these better. And of course, being a very, very new disease, but having these huge ramifications, it's absolutely turned, um, you know, it's, it's been a pandemic that has turned our lives topsy turvy. So it's very important that we do research and share whatever knowledge different countries and this is happening beautifully and the vaccine uh, again is an example of how all these communities all these countries collectively we've all been able to work 
together in this area. Now, the end-to-end -end cycle approach, of course, just to give a larger picture before getting into prevention, uh, which is the main theme for today, we do have prevention, clinical management. So we're looking at containing the transmission, infrastructure preparedness. And then if we start on the left-hand top, the prevention part, basically it's all about promoting COVID appropriate behavior, vaccination, community engagement. But similarly, you need HR for the clinical management for the prevention part, and also the sequelae mit mitigation that we spoke about just now, whether it is mucor, mycosis, or whether it is any of the other uh, post-COVID complications. And of course, uh, based on all this in each of the waves, each of the peaks that we have seen, not only in our state, but in other parts of India, other states, other countries, the idea is to also keep studying these. I'm very happy and proud to share that even in our state, we've been carrying out a very large number of autopsies as well. And ICMR was very keen to engage in a study with our uh, teams, medical teams, especially in hospitals like the one at Rajkot, to see what are the evidence, what are the research learnings, findings. So addressing these and then sharing this research knowledge and management is also very important. So there are the end-to-end -end approach has innovations, human resources, and of course, patient-centric. This is a picture that I really like. It talks about you know, this classical, it, it, it's, it talks about prevention being better than cure. I mean, if we leave the tap open and the capacity of the wash basin is to hold a certain amount of water, but if we absolutely don't do anything about closing the tap or addressing it, then well, any number of mops, any number of people to mop it is going to make uh, life really difficult. And therefore prevention uh, is, is the key to this whole thing. And their governance also in prevention. How do we get the governance structures? And I think Gujarat has shown some very good aspects of governance and leadership here, promoting COVID appropriate behavior, engaging with the community, containing transmission, vaccination, all of these are components of it. This also tells about the scenario, Gujarat vis-a-vis -vis other states. And then now if we move to governance, so one of, we, we, we did a lot of activities here for prevention. So the, the first uh, thing to which I would attribute a great deal of um, the success that we've been able to get, a lot of it would be, most of it would be attributed to the core committee. The fact that we were perhaps one of the only states where on a daily basis, every evening, and the average duration of the meeting would be about two hours with all the senior officers, right from the chief minister, the deputy chief minister who's also the health minister, the chief secretary of the state and all the senior officers uh, right up to the um, other connected officers of the level of, uh, you know, secretary, principal secretary health and so on. We would all be there and uh, there would be inputs that had been received during the day, feedback from the ground, inputs from districts, corporations. It would all be discussed there threadbare. And so it was It was a very, very useful single window, window system of actually, uh, you know, being able to respond to the situation and not just take decisions. Decisions, it was possible because everybody was together on the same page. Not only was that decisions were being implemented, the follow-up was happening. And then if there were any glitches, any gaps, that was also being, the feedback would come there. And so it helped iron out a lot of these difficulties and so on. Similarly, decentralized leadership. We had the district collectors and municipal commissioners who also had senior IS officers to oversee the COVID response. I think these teams also did fantastic work uh, and it was very, very context specific. So there was not a one size fits all solution. So Surat handled things in a different way. Rajkot used certain different strategies. Ahmedabad even handled it a little differently and so did Vadodara. So you had these local contexts dictated what could be the approach there and that was also done very effectively. Similarly, strong enforcement of public health and social measures with the help of police, the help of the local self-government bodies, urban bodies and municipal corporations, the district administration, SOPs for different sectors and their enforcement. Well, we have to do even more in this direction and I'd appeal to all the people watching this today, even Ahmedabad Management Association members to see how this can be done. And of course, planning, which has been completed for the third wave. The third wave planning process also was started. Uh, the first presentation was made by our team to the 
core committee on 10th of May and then went through several rounds of iteration. And finally, uh, it was adopted and uh, around the 9th, 11th and 14th of June. And finally, now nodal officers have also been appointed. So it's an excellent way now that there is some breathing time and having uh, got some experience of actually having dealt with two such waves. I think uh, the state government has left no stone unturned in terms of exhaustively in, in great detail planning, and especially knowing that in the second wave, those vulnerable population or segments of the population which were not vaccinated had greater vulnerability, especially care is being taken for the pediatric segment for pregnant mothers and so on for the third wave. Similarly, now when we come back to COVID appropriate behavior, one of the activities that Gujarat took a lead and we did was in terms of engaging with Ashoka University. And we actually came up with a complete toolkit called these social, I mean, it was, it was a social and behavior change communication toolkit. And you can see it's all pictorially shown here. And if some of you are interested, we'll be very happy to share the entire uh, toolkit with you. Uh, you can also use it at your workplaces, in your communities, so that more and more people, it's available in English and in Gujarati. We had piloted this in Mahisagar district. And then for the first time, it was tried out in Surat. You can actually see me here in Surat in one of the locations where we tried it out. And similarly, then across the state, and this is the way the health worker would actually carry these uh, flip kind of books, the flip charts, and explain to people what is to be done. There were many instructions at the back and so on. So this was proactive engagement with the media also for risk communication and interpersonal communication. So it was not something that was just left to. Of course, we did use mass media in a very big way, social media in a very big way, but IPC or interpersonal communication was also used. Now, when you talk of community engagement, you can see that this is something that happened also in the first wave. There were many gram panchayats which took the lead and here you can see the Honorable Chief Minister visiting uh, the Gram Panchayat as a part of the Marugam Corona Mukt Gam and Marugam Corona Rasi Yukta Gam. So a village which is 100% vaccinated for the eligible population and the fact that you have these facilities in place which has been now done across all the Gram Panchayats of Gujarat. So we have these uh, COVID care centers, community COVID care centers in readiness in the gram panchayats so that any person who has symptoms, we actually assume, we use the word suspect isolation and presumptive treatment. Because the treatment to begin with, first of all, you have to break the chain of transmission. So the minute you isolate people having these symptoms in a separate enclosure or a separate uh, facility, COVID care center of this kind, and put them on rest and then make uh, simple medicines available to them to begin with. In fact, we're also collaborating with Mayo Clinic, Stanford University, and uh, you know, with the help of uh, WHO to, to really take this forward in a big way. And we find that there's absolutely no need to over-medicalize this. Initially, when the symptoms are very mild, or it's almost uh, a very, very uh, simple kind of uh, manifestation of the disease, all you need is paracetamol. Of course, you have to keep pulse oximeters, thermometers to keep checking the six minute test. So all that has been done, a lot of warm water and of course, gargling and also steam inhalation uh, or nebulizer, etc. cetera. Uh, Buddhist site is also shown to uh, give a lot of good effective um, you know, relief in this case and also for treatment. So that has also been included, the inhaler Buddhist so similarly, the COVID committees, COVID sahayaks and volunteers. So this time we are trying to engage more and more volunteers, whether they're from the NCC, NSS and so on, to go and propagate and really reach out to people and ensure that the do's and do's don't are adhered to. Again, when you talk of containing transmission or preventing, we, this was again an idea uh, that was you know, given by our Honorable Chief Minister, Ahmedabad, piloted this for the first time and it was found to be extremely successful. So we had these Dhanvantri ruts, which were basically vans equipped with all different medicines, including uh, basic tests uh, for the non-communicable diseases, because as we know, COVID has been more pronounced, the rate of infection, the rate of mortality and morbidity 
also has been more in the case of patients or people with comorbidities. And therefore, we wanted to make sure that anyone with blood pressure, high blood pressure, or anyone with uh, diabetes during the lockdown period initially in the first wave and later on, some of them would be hesitant to go to hospitals and take medication. So these became uh, little vans, Tanvantri ruts became ruts which would carry all of these medication. Uh, you, you see, test people, check them out, screen them and give them whatever basic medications they needed. Additionally, Gujarat takes pride in the fact that uh, we distributed as many as 12 crore 90 lakh doses of Ukara, Amrut Pay. This is the hot, warm concoction which has various medicinal herbs that Ayurveda has prescribed. And this was this found became very popular. Village after village, we found the Sarpanch and the community actually brewing these um, Ukaras, boiling them collectively, and then ensuring that these were served to people. Samsamni Vatti, another medicine here about a crore and 84 lakh of these were distributed. Similarly, the homeopathy medicine. I'm very happy to share that even in many rural areas, I've, I've heard reports from districts such as Korbandar in the, in the, uh, on, on the western side, South Gujarat, North Gujarat, different villages, but the same uh, you know, message being reinforced. Villages after villages were covered by Arsenicum album. And they found that many of these absolutely did not uh, face the brunt of the disease. They did not get infected. And when we also in the quarantine centers, uh, we gave Ayurveda prophylaxis, that is preventive medicine to about 19,686 people. Similarly, homeopathy medicines were also given preventive medicines to about 14,948 persons there in the quarantine centers, out of which only 100 people finally tested positive or got infected which means a, a very tiny, minuscule 0.29%, which means 99.7% of them did not. Similarly, a medicine called Ayush 64, it has again shown that when it is given, that the timing is important right at the initial stages. It found that the instance of uh, the disease getting more virulent or the need for oxygen was significantly less. So these are all the Ayush interventions 104 helpline. This was again something very special to Gujarat. Facility, quarantine, strategic, rapid antigen testing and enhanced RT-PCR testing. We now have this facility across the state. We have doubled our capacity in Gujarat. So all these were very, very good initiatives that the state government took. Similarly, vaccination. Gujarat, as I mentioned, has been uh, sort of consistently the leader in vaccination for the greater than 44 years category healthcare workers, frontline workers, and the highest number of doses per million in the country among these top big states. And similarly, 35% of the population has been covered by at least one dose. And we saw some of the statistics earlier to say that if we reach some of these tipping points, as has been seen in some of the countries, the mortality, even if there were to be a third wave, which is likely is what the experts say, we'll have a lot of uh, reduction, a huge reduction in the number of uh, cases getting infections and the number of deaths. About 5,000 COVID vaccination centers across the state. And now with the supply of vaccine available in a more comfortable way, we have both on-site and online registration available. So this today has been the, the Maha Abhiyan, Rasikaran Maha Abhiyan was flagged off, inaugurated today. And so today a very large number of people are being vaccinated and we will hope that this a kind of enthusiasm, this kind of a proactive um, response from the public also continues. And of course, research and knowledge, we've had research committees, clinical trials, also Gujarat has been a part of it, case studies, policy brief. And this is the uh, policy brief, again, which was put together uh, by, as I mentioned, the WHO, it was called GIDNAR. So that has also been done. So finally, uh, we, we, it's very important when we talk of prevention, uh, prevention, an ounce of prevention, as the, the great Benjamin uh, Franklin has said, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And as we said, do we want this choice of staying at home or in a hospital bed? Do we want to wear a mask, triple layer mask, or do we want to uh, make our near and dear ones vulnerable to actually, uh, you know, be in need of a ventilator mask? Or do we want to follow social distancing or otherwise be in complete isolation? These are some of the questions 
that uh, if we ask ourselves to do some soul searching and take the leadership for making this available for the community as a whole i think it would be uh, a great step forward and once again i think what this disease has really taught all of us is the fact that the disease has again given us a jolt it has really given us a shake up as it were and made us realize that lifestyle is also very important the importance of a basic immunity being in place certain hygiene practices whenever we return home from going out anywhere imperative to wash our hands and when the infection is on if the positivity is there i think a lot of us who were in the government and visiting hospitals on a daily basis one of the things we used to religiously follow is that whenever you enter your home one would have a bath and make sure because you do not want to make other members of the family who may be vulnerable uh, you know get infected we shouldn't be in any way doing anything that may turn out to be irresponsible similarly when we look at triggers neighboring cities neighboring states or even neighbors in our own community if you hear that there are cases immediately i think the fact that we start you know putting on all those the do's and don'ts very strictly is very important and of course to strengthen our lungs uh, practicing yoga pranayam and uh, i think uh, also important as as you have mentioned it's very important that we all have a positive uh, outlook mental health again has taken uh, it has been very traumatic for a lot of people not just patients and their families but even the general public because for about now as i said it's been uh, more uh, such a long time a year and 3 months and 3 days ever since the first case so to be cooped up sometimes or the same messages that keep um, you know staring at you whether it's media social media whatsapp forwards and so on so this is not to say that we become complacent but i think this kind of panic as uh, one of our task force members would say more than a pandemic it had become and it has become a panic demic so i think all these things have also taken a toll but i think end of the day one of the biggest learnings for a lot of us uh, has been the fact that uh, this pandemic has really taught us to be very compassionate it has taught us the meaning of um, the word humility the fact that we cannot ever you know believe that we know it all it it shows how sometimes helpless we can be in in front of uh, nature but that doesn't mean we give up at all but it also shows the power of um, you know people doing research across global communities coming up with vaccines in such a record uh, period short period of time and the kind of interventions we've collectively done so on this note i think there's a lot that each one of us can do the do's and don'ts that we spoke of if all of us can practice these and propagate these uh, in our communities take the leadership for this i think we can certainly ensure that even if the third wave were to come were to happen uh, we can certainly flatten the curve and make sure that it doesn't uh, hit us the way the first two waves had and especially the second wave had so on this uh, note i want once again want to thank all of you it says it said that of course intellectual solve problems but they say geniuses prevent problems from happening so if all of us decide to invoke that genius in us and this is uh, not easy but it is simple what is asked for is simple is it difficult is it rocket science to wear a mask even at home when you're with your elders or with young babies it's definitely possible if we practice it is it rocket science when you come back home to have a bath is it rocket science to wash your hand keep a distance at office and respect people not not a distance in terms of uh, you know reaching out to them sharing thoughts but yes a distance physical distance and so on so i think a lot of this and keeping your rooms ventilated we all like some fresh air we want to smell the flowers so if there's a way to keep the windows open of course you'll have to get the smell uh, when it wafts through the mask but i think uh, in a lighter vein i think all of these uh, are certainly doable and if we all decide i think it would be possible to certainly mitigate minimize and ensure that the third wave doesn't hit us in a manner that um, you know we're not able to deal with it or in a manner that makes us really look back with remorse so once again thank you to all of you
Thank you very much, Dr. Jayanti Ravi. Yes, am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Jayanti Ravi, uh, for this, your inaugural talk with the theme, Prevention is Better Than Cure. And in the context of the COVID-19, you know, where, you know, the, the last part you said that we have all learned a lot of new things. COVID has taught us a lot of things, basic things, you know, like even the examples you give, I don't want to repeat, but like simple things, the precautions we take, cleanliness, wearing of masks. And people have realized that in a dusty state like Gujarat, wearing of masks has prevented a lot of cold and cough, especially during the winter times and the post winter or the, you know, monsoon time. So these are again, lessons for us. And you have shown us some interesting, you know, insights during your experience in the healthcare sector in Gujarat, you know, about our public health and your four year stint, you know, so a lot of besides COVID other examples and where, you know, some of the measures that took Gujarat from the 17th uh, position to the first position, you know, and uh, in, uh, uh, again, Similarly, is you know various examples you gave about the COVID-19 and the significance of the preventive measures, you know, and how they will all be useful not only for the health administrators but the citizens at large, basically. And as you said, let's all you know very much try as a joint endeavor to prepare the for the so-called third wave. And the second wave has taught us a lot of things, and we are all uh, you know making our best to see that uh, these things, uh, you know, this third wave will not be as bad, provided, uh, you know, we take all the precautionary measures. And uh, Madam, it was really uh, certainly a very enriching and very an engaging talk with all the data you could share with us for the public. And you've also been kind enough that anyone wants the data or any kind of charts you have for prevention, you will be happy to share with us. And uh, really grateful to you accepting our invitation for the inaugural talk of this, uh, you know, AMA week, Healthcare Week, which is, you know, I would call it like a Bhagavad Sapta, you know, seven days, you know, like we had the previous things. And uh, as you also mentioned, today is an auspicious day. It's the uh, International Day of the Yoga and also the World Music Day. And as per our Indian lunar calendar, it's also the Ekadashi today. So once again, Dr. Jandri Ravi, thank you very much. And I also thank the the participants today for participating in large numbers. And also I'm sure you'll be participating in the talks coming from tomorrow to Sunday also. And um, thanks for the AMA team for hosting it. And Madam, uh, last but not the least, we wish you all the very best uh, in your new stint as the you know secretary of the Oroville Foundation uh, near Puducherry. And I'm sure this is a area close to your heart, a very different field. And I wish you all the very best, madam. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Divyash Bhai. And uh, I was also seeing some of the chat, uh, uh, yes. you know, responses and questions, etc. So yeah. very, very, very happy to be, to have been uh, with all of you today. And uh, today, of course, as, as you said as well, music day, it's also the Ekadashi. And I've been uh, also wanted to say, I've been practicing uh, this thing of you know actually keeping a fast on ekadashi now for several years and 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 i think all these are simple lifestyle measures which do give do. you boost yes. your immunity they do give yes. you a lot of strength so once again um, thank you so much yes. and uh, wish you again ama has been doing phenomenal work and i'm very happy that you've taken the lead even in this sector of uh, wellness through management thank you it's a pleasure and even though you'll be there, we will seek your participation in different programs, Madam, because you've been very close to AMA. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Yeah. Anything from Mukundar Radhika? Okay. Uh, we conclude and uh, looking forward to participants for tomorrow's meet. Huh? Thank you all once again and good night to all of you.